Dave Ely. So Ely is doing his master's degree, full name, what is it called? The Master's in Leadership and yeah, at the University of British Columbia, which is pretty neat. Um, Julie did his advanced coaching diploma here in our program here. We were in the same class together, so it's good to get to know Julie through that. Julie's now also one of the mentors, one of only two mentors that we have in the diploma program. So he gets to work with a lot of our upcoming high performance coaches. Um, Julie's been a high performance coach himself for a lot of years now. He's worked in wheelchair rugby for many years. Athletics. Ten, years. Ten years, yeah. So pretty cool. I get to see Julie running on the track uh, with some athletes quite often and um, has been involved, had a, an Olympian at the last Paralympics in Rio and got to go himself um, and has been coaching that for a very long time. So Julie's going to be speaking tonight on podium performance tracking. Have, do any of your sports have, like any of the sports that any of you guys are involved with, have a podium self track that you know of? Do you guys know of one? Yeah, it's a pretty neat process. It's a new process are going through it's very relevant for coaches so I'm excited for tonight's session because it'll actually you know be hands on for your coaching which tonight will be fun. Go ahead. All right. Yeah. Good. And we do have we can thank you very much. Nice and heavy introduction. I'm really uh, happy to be here today and uh, talk to you guys. Um, uh, first of all I would like to uh, say that this is going to be hopefully a little bit of a podium track where if any of you have any questions at any time um, feel free to you know, uh, you can put up your hands or just you know, shout it right out. And, uh, because I know there is a lot of experience in the room too that often you know, have already had a uh, track of the podium as well. Um, so yeah, my name is Yuli, as I mentioned. And I would like first, uh, Natasha already talked a little bit about my background. I originally uh, grew up in Switzerland and my, uh, my first school was really it's like every kid in Switzerland. So I, I grew up on the hill, and then at the age of 16, I switched over to track and field and had a, quite a, a steep uh, career development. Uh, by the age of 19, I made my first national team, and uh, by the age of 21, I made national team in the uh, And then uh, uh, was on the national team, tried to make the Olympics in 2004, missed it by just about Hundred meter, <laughs> it was really close. I made it to the world championships and um, had some great experiences there. I think I learned a few of my best. I also trained at the uh, IOC training center in Calgary. So when I was twenty years old, I wanted to know uh, what are the Kenyans doing different than the Ugandans that were there. <laughs> you know, why are they so good? And I went there and I trained at the IOC. Uh, I might talk a little bit later, but there, there wasn't really a big secret because I had <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> so, but I always was really curious about what are the top ones that are doing really well. And so, anyways, I met my wife who's Canadian along the way, and she took me over here to Canada. I didn't know where she was, where she was. <laughs> and uh, I started running uh, with the group at Dalhousie. Yeah, I know there's some Dalhousie students here, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> great, it was a great program. It really got me started um, to learn using more kind of the research and evidence based kind of like approach to my own kind of training. And I, that during that time, I also started coaching um, kind of by group with girls um, who being in a wheelchair. Um, I knew a friend of mine, and uh, she wanted to do the Blue Notes Marathon. And uh, so the friend mentioned, oh, you should talk to Yuli, who's a runner. He knows about running. <laughs> so she approached me, and I just said, you know, I'm interested in learning more. And so we sat down. I asked her, what was the smallest thing? And she said, she five feet, so that was the part of she, so I suggested, let's just start with a half marathon. And so we trained for that, and she did the half, and uh, I still remember, like, the last um, stretch where she came in 
could be like four hours, quite a long time. But she came down and the people were cheering her on, and her and, and she was just crying, and she was so excited about you know being able to finish that race. And that's where I really got up and I really felt the change. I was like, wow, this is awesome. You know, it was not a high performance run in that day. She was like four hours and a half in the morning. You know? But <laughs> It's just I kind of really enjoyed helping uh, somebody to achieve something. I think that is my still is my motivation to help somebody to become the best they can be. Like I said, the whole wheelchair thing was just a bit of a fluke, but also later on I realized that I can do so much more by helping people to achieve their goals. So I covered everything. Um, just quickly around the, the room, I'd like to get to know a little bit what sports you're from, because that will guide my presentation a little bit too. Um, we will start right. Maybe your name and your sport. Uh, Steve Carroll. Yeah, Archer. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, good. So we got some individual sports, we got some team sports. I do have to admit, this presentation is more on individual sports. It's going to be a little bit more focused on track and really focused on wheelchair racing. So there is, uh, but there is definitely a lot of crossover sections of five sports and eight of other sports. Uh, but as I said, like a lot of Which is actually it's really interesting. I'm, I'm doing my masters right now uh, at UBC in athletic education, and the leadership was 18 of us, and we had 15 different sports. And the first week when I went into uh, our orientation week, I was like, we already won four sports, we have only three sports, but I very quickly realized that actually, you know, when it comes to All right, so tonight I'm going to mostly talk about podium, uh, uh, podium performance track and my podium results track. And it's a bit of a new term in, in, in the whole high performance sport world, but it really came down from on the podium. Does everybody know what I mean with on the podium? It's like our funding partner. It, it, it dictates who gets money and who doesn't get the money. And really, uh, that's what it boils down a lot in sports. It's like, where can I get some resources to do more things? And uh, so I have a, a couple of clips here to get you a little uh, excited, hopefully, about what we're going to be talking today. So first, the first clip is on uh, the movie uh, Moneyball. Actually, all clips from Moneyball. Has anybody seen Moneyball? So it's basically it's this um, it's this movie about uh, a baseball team. It's about a coach who's from Alabama, who has to work with a very minimal budget. Um, they've been losing a lot, and they have no more money. They're a very involved, uh, involved team. He will explain it to you right now. What the we call softball is. like this? You know, you're not even looking at the problem. You're very aware of the problem. You okay? Good. What's the problem? Look, Billy, we all understand what the problem is. We have to okay, replace. Good. What's the problem? The problem is we have to replace three key players in our no. lineup. What's the problem? Same as it's ever been. We've got to replace these guys with what we have existing. No, what's the problem, Barry? We need 38 home runs, 120 RBIs, and 47 doubles to replace. The problem we're trying to solve is that there are rich teams and there are poor teams. Then there's 50 feet of crap, and then there's us. <laughs> it's an unfair game. Mm -hmm. 
So Billy here, he's the coach, and he had this first group with all the other um, scouts out there uh, who are helping him. So actually, he's the general manager. He's not even the coach. He's got my dog. And this is kind of their first <coughs> meeting, you know, coming together. They're trying to figure out how can we improve this performance. He called the low crab, <laughs> getting back up for the for the next year. Um, and now we've been gutted. Organ donors for the rich. Boston's taking our kidneys. Yankees taking our heart. And you guys are sitting around talking the same old good body nonsense, like we're selling jeans, like we're looking for Fabio. Think differently. We are the last dog at the bowl. You see what happens to the runt of the litter? He dies. Really, that's a very touching story and everything, but I think we're all very much aware of what we're facing here. You have a lot of experience and wisdom in this room. Now, you need to have a little bit of faith and let us do the job of replacing Giambi. Is there another first baseman like Giambi? No, not really. No. And if there was, could we afford him? Nope. Then what the fuck are you talking about, man? If we try to play like the Yankees in here, we will lose to the Yankees out there. Well, that sounds like fortune cookie wisdom to me, Billy. No, that's just logic. Who's Fabio? The shortstop. The shortstop is. Why? So who is Fabio? <laughs> Has anybody ever felt sometimes uh, you know, with the basketball that you just said, the ball got stolen from the goal team, or from the goal set, or there was a lack of resources or anything like that, and you sometimes you get just stuck at a certain point, and you, you're trying to do the same thing again over and over, because that's just the way the game is. But you have the ceiling, you can't do it because you don't have So that's where they are. And I think a lot of sports is going through this at the same time. Rather than looking at what the real problem is, that we like to kind of say, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that, right? So the next clip then, so it goes on, the coach goes out and kind of tries to figure out how that, so he comes across this uh, economics uh, graduate from Yale University who is very much into Also has a bit of a, he doesn't really know anything about baseball, um, but he kind of runs into the manager and he says, well, you know, there's certain things that I think you guys can do better. So they start talking and, and it, long story short, the general manager eventually, he, he hires him on as his data analysis guy or whatever you want to call it. Um, and so after his first day at work, this is what he was doing. So using this equation here at the left right here, I'm projecting that we need to win at least 99 games for the PC plus season. We need to score at least 814 runs in order to win those games and allow no more than 645 runs. What's this? This is the code that I've written for our year-to-year -year projections. This is building in all the intelligence that we have to project players. It's about getting things down to one number. Using stats the way we read them, we'll find value in players that nobody else can see. People are overlooked for a variety of biased reasons and, and perceived flaws. Age, appearance, and personality. Bill James and mathematics cut straight through that. Bill, of the 20,000 notable players for us to consider, I believe that there is a championship team of 25 people that we can afford. Because everyone else in baseball undervalues them. Like, an island of misfit toys. 
So this is Chad Bradford. He's a relief pitcher. He's one of the most undervalued players in baseball. His defect is that he throws hard. Nobody in the big leagues cares about him because he looks like this guy could be not just the best pitcher in our bullpen, but one of the most effective relief pitchers in all of baseball. This guy should cost me a million dollars. We can get him for two hundred thirty-seven thousand. that we make decisions on on somebody being good or not. Um, we're, we're being subjected to something. This is how the idea that we put together a team. We're having results and having data really is going to help us to make more uh, object, objective uh, decisions. Now, having said that, um, I don't think that everything can be now, there's always this half taken. And this move is probably taken because they're very extreme. And, you know, the type of numbers you're going to see, I can tell you, in, in my um, results tracking, I, I didn't go into writing my own code. I can tell you that <laughs> right now. So it's taken it to a very extreme, but I think it's, it's neat to think about this that if we have the data to back up something, then sometimes a, a player look totally different in the future. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna show you one more play um, where they actually get to the team collection and he's Ooh, presenting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I am still trying to replace John. Told you we can't do it. We can't do it. Now, what we might be able to do is we create him. We create him in the aggregate. You know what? Jambi's on base percentage is 477. Damon's on base, 324. And Almatis was 291. Add that up and you get. Do you want me to speak? Yeah, I'll speak. Okay. Ten ninety two divided by three. Three sixty four. That's what we're looking for. Three ball players, three ball players, his average OBP is 364. That doesn't look right, doesn't it? Right. Billy, you're going to carry the one. Billy, it's 364. Yeah. Who's that? That's Pete. Does Pete really need to be here? Yes, he does. Okay, here's what we want. Number one. Jason's little brother, Jeremy. Billy, uh, that's trouble. Uh, Billy, look, if, if I, yeah, Billy, if I may, uh, certainly he's had his problems off the field. We know what he can't do on the field. You get a little thicker on the race. Yeah, and there's reports about him on the weed and the strip clubs. Well, his on-base percentage is all we're looking at. And Jeremy gets on base an awful lot for a guy who only costs 285000 Jeez, Billy. Number two. David Justice. Mm -hmm. Not a good idea. Old man Justice. Why is that? Steinbrenner is so pissed at his decline that he's willing to eat a big chunk of his contract just to get rid of him. Anyway. Exactly. Ten years ago, David Justice, big name, done a lot of big games. He's going to really help our season tickets early in the year. But we get in the dog days in July and August, he's lucky if he's going to hit his weight. So his, his legs yeah. are gone. So he's, uh, He's a defensive liability, and I question whether his bat speed is still there. His legs are gone. Great. We'll be lucky to get 60 games out of him. Why do you like him? He gets on base. So what, what is this? What do we do? Okay, number three. Scott Hadley. Who? Hadley. 
Exactly. It seems like an Oakland A already. And yes, he's had a little problem with the cell. He can't throw. He's got a career 260 hitter. That's part of his career is over. I say he's just getting started. I know Boston wants to cut him and no one wants to pick him up. That's good for us. It's cheap. Let me get this let me get this straight. You're gonna get a guy that's been released by half the organizations of professional baseball because he's got non repairable nerve damage in his elbow. He can't throw. He can't throw and he can't feel. What can he do? Guys, check the reports or I'm gonna point it to you. He's dead on base. So he walks a lot. He gets on base a lot. So do I care if it's a walk or a hit? Eats? You do not. <laughs> I do not. So then, why? You're unhappy, Grady. Why? <laughs> wow. May I speak again? Sure, go ahead. Major League Baseball and its fans, they're going to be more than happy to throw you and Google Boy under the bus if you keep doing what you're doing here. You don't put a team together with a computer, Billy. No? No. Baseball isn't just numbers. It's not science. If it was, then anybody could do what we're doing, but they can't because they don't know what we know. They don't have our experience and they don't have our intuition. Okay. Billy, you got a kid in there that's got a degree in economics from Yale. You got a scout here with 29 years of baseball experience. Yeah. You're listening to the wrong one. Now, there are intangibles that only baseball people understand. You're discounting what scouts have done for 150 years, even yourself. Dab to die. So we got to adapt. I mean, today in the world, we have so much um, access to data, to results, scoring, uh, and uh, other things that we can test. Um, really, as coaches, I think we need to repeat that value, you know, and not just go by our experience and by our gut. You know, there's still, uh, again, when the movie shows that it's a bit too extreme and all these things all the experience is, is not really <laughs> um, any valuable but I think there really is a lot of um, a lot of value in it using the data to its our advantage as we claim but also when we go and talk to of the selection committee or a funding committee and say look here is the data this is the evidence um, that's why you should be That's why you should be giving us money, putting money into this particular athlete because the data should be given to us. So this slide here is a uh, uh, courtesy of Dr. Nick Musica, who's one of my professors at UNLV, a relatively senior employee. He came up with this uh, three-stage kind of a progression of analytics in, in, in sports. We have a stage one where we do data collection, Recon identification. That's what we're doing with the coding results tracking. So it's actually just one little part of the whole stage, um, but I think an important part. That's why it's called that. Uh, custom metrics, performance prediction, uh, visualization tools. So meaning everything that we can collect and everything that we can make it visual. So it's one thing to have numbers, right? But in order to really read things, we actually have to be able to make some. Talk a bit later on, it's actually not that hard to do. Uh, we find by learning the events that later, uh, whether it is you get some graphs together. I don't know, everybody, every coach is different. Um, and then the stage two would be going into some simulation, creating a gold medal profile. I'm not going to go too much into the gold medal profile today because the gold medal profile would show what an athlete in this particular sport or in this event would have to be. Order to be put in that a technical, tactical, uh, psychological, physical, everything entails. And that's a lot of information. But if you want to build a gold medal profile, you have to do coding results right. Because you've got to know where are the benchmarks, where uh, does this athlete have to be, and who is it, and what do these athletes look like. Because 
you'll see some patterns and some factors that are high performing at the top level. And I'm going to talk a lot about world top level today because that's what I work with in the international team. And, but this, by no means, you can scale this down to a French level or a, a university level and just apply it to that. It's looking at who are the top then stage three would then be events analytics, analytics. So optimizing a roster, a real-time analytics. Uh, the soccer team, for example, our women's uh, national soccer team has a, a lot of GPS data. They have good real-time data where they're they're watching them. How many how many kilometers or how many meters have they covered? Where do they where is their kind of uh, uh, where they in what position they are? So there's a lot of then real time data that comes to the coaches that helps them to make sure that they can then make better decisions. So after they look at the historical data, they're then using real time data to make decisions. And we're not just making gut feeling decisions, oh, this athlete you know, uh, doesn't look too good today. You actually have the data to back it up. So if you do an analytics, it's a lot better than just looking at the athlete's game. So comes into uh, injury prevention. Right, so any questions to this point? Now this is another slide from Henry Benutian. There's a lot of stuff on here and you, you probably can't read um, some of it, which is, is not, it's, it's okay. I'm just going to quickly go through it. Um, so GMP is, is Gold medal profile and WSP is the winning style of performance in sports. When we're wanting to assess a team or to see um, what kind of uh, uh, benchmark or where do we want to get our team, we, we, we have kind of four phases, okay? So phase one is an audit. You gotta have to understand your scores in order to do goal results. don't know your scores, um, it's really hard to figure out what's actually important and what's not. I have I don't know much about baseball. Do I watch it? Because probably, but I still don't know much about baseball. So I don't really know when they were talking about this and this and all that. Okay? But for them it makes sense. So you gotta have to have a good knowledge of your sport, of the competition. Um, when are the competitions? What is your LKD? Long-term athlete, long enough. Okay, what is the pathway that you're taking a, a, an athlete through? And that's your phase one. You really got to be a student of your sport and knowing your sport. Okay. Then we get into phase two, and that's the performance results path. So we got to then look at who are some of our top um, performers and what are our athletes compared to. What is the curve of the athlete that we're working with? Are they on an up curve? Are they on a down curve? Um, or a certain performance um, measure? Ideally, you want to have everybody going up. If all of your athletes going down, you might have to look at the training program a bit. Um, or maybe the way you're doing power diving and conditioning, right? But the way we can do this is by data uh, data mining, data uh, acquisition, data interpretation. So data mining meaning, for us in track and field, um, you know, I get a results base like Athletics Canada has a database of all the results, all the teams and best. Um, the International Paralympic Committee has a database of all the wheelchair races that I'll show you later, with all the results in there. And again, because you know, 10 or 20 years ago, we probably didn't have that uh, database. But now I can access data 10 years back. And so I can pick a particular athlete that is top right now, and I can look at what did they do last year, what did they do the year before, what did they do before that, and look at their progression, and then interpret that. And that way I can build gold medal profile for, for my athletes or for my program that I think 
this year. Now, having said that, that's a theory. Um, a lot of times, and we all know, you know, there's ups and downs. You know, there's injuries that happen. There might be some other factors that play in. But if we never make that pathway, we never really know where our benchmarks are. I think that's the key here is um, having benchmarks and knowing the path, knowing your, your, your pathway without freaking out too much if you're not really on it and you want to do something all the time. If you're not on it for four or five years, you can tell me that you're not on it. Um, and then we have Phase four, that's where we really integrate it into the high performance system where we all the team selection criteria, where we do uh, the high performance planning, the quadrennial plan. So all of our programming then should be based on the gold medal profile. So we should be doing our programming to make our athletes better in the things that matter. And that's really important because, like I said, when I went to Kenya, <laughs> And I saw uh, what they did, they just trained their own. You know what? In track running, you got to run. So, <laughs> and that's the bottom line. It, it's really simple and easy. It's like, you want to run fast, you got to run a lot, you know, <laughs> at the right speed. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, now, of course, like I said, it's, it's all quite complicated. I'm into the structure. If you need me to really go into and give you an example for everything, but uh, I'm just yeah. going to give you an Yeah. And so he'll know, you know, from basketball to um, award. Yeah, he, he worked with a lot of international organizations. Yeah. I also wanted to mention that um, when it comes to that analysis, Four guys who are full time job is to do data analysis for sports. So, for different Olympic sports, all they do all day is they go through results and they figure <laughs> out certain patterns and then they might even write codes or I don't know to, to predict how many medals we're going to win later on or what oh. needs to be done or coded. But so when it comes to the uh, to the to the track meeting, there's some focus areas uh, that we can look at. So what are the benchmarks? What is the metrics? The sources? Where do we get it from? And the data gathering function. So how can we um, get it? Like I said, a lot of stuff is online, but you know what? Some sports still do print out results, and you might have to go through it by hand and figure that out. How will you represent the benchmarks? You know, what kind of graphs can you use? We haven't talked about that yet too. And how will you show progression uh, over time? How is that going to come out? Uh, can you plot an athlete or team against the, the podium results track or the winning style of play to validate the point? So again, it's all about validating what you're doing in your daily training environment and what you're doing with your athletes. Based on evidence, not just on a gut feeling. You want to get away from just using a gut feeling or just kind of doing it because our coach did it and their coach did it like that, and it worked for us. You know, one thing I learned over the last ten years of coaching on a high performance level is that everybody needs a vision, and you can't just apply one thing to the other. But if you don't have any data, you don't have any evidence. So here's just one simple thing. So I'm going to use quite a lot of track um, examples, but this is a, a one simple graph uh, that was done by UK Athletics. So they looked at the men's 100 meter performance funnel. So when we talk about a funnel, is you'll see here on the on the sides that's the time. So 990 would be our top time, and then 1050 is the bottom. Okay. Um, this here is years out from a major championship. So if we have a major championships, let's say this is 2018. Uh, let's say we have world four championships. Um, or, well, let's say last year. It was last year. Um, 
2017, okay? Then this will be 2016, 2015, 2012, so five years out. This up here, these are our top three. Up here, that's our top three. Nine, nine, dump, ten, seven. Okay. These guys here, it's finalists. So these are our top eight. Right? That would be four to eight, right? And this here, you know, they might get to 10, 20, 10, 30. They're probably there. They're not going to make it. Now, when we look at the, the, the podium, the top three, we go five years back, they were at a time of 10, 15, between 10, 20. Okay. The ones who were fourth, they were just they're still around here. And again, this might be a little bit of a gray zone, but the one who is at 10, 40 will end up around 10, 10. So they're not going to go on the list. Okay. So, that funnel shows you kind of how we can predict where somebody where somebody should be. Okay. Now again, there's always outliers. Uh, Andre de Graaf. He didn't start uh, track and field until nine or ten years old. He was playing basketball before he crossed over and that became it. I would say within three years <coughs> he went from a ten forty to a two hundred and fifty. Okay. So it's definitely some of those outliers. Out there, but generally, if everything uh, goes normal, that's kind of a funnel, and that's based on data that UK Athletics collects. Okay. Um, we also see here that we're looking a little bit at a, an age range, 23 to 21. Okay. Um, but that's again based on data uh, that we take an average. There's always outliers. We have some people. Uh, Tim Collins, he just retired, and he was 41, and he was still at the uh, at the Olympics, I think he made the final um, at, at the age of 40. So it's kind of like the This is another graph here. Um, it's taken for a track and field again. Um, so what we see here, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2016. The blue zone is our junior zone, all right? So this is 11, <clears throat> well, probably 10, 9, down to 10, 8. And that shows they took that bandwidth. Um, an average junior at a world level would be within this zone, okay? And it kind of fluctuates, and we'll talk about in certain sports, in an Olympic year, it will be a lot lower or the, the, the performance will be higher, the times will be lower, um, whereas in a non-Olympic year it will be a lot farther away. The green zone will be our transition zone, all right? So that's like the under 23 for a certain sport, or were you going from a junior level to a senior level? Then we have a top 16 zone with this gray zone, a finalist with the dark gray, and then we have a medal zone, all right? And that's pretty much under 10 seconds. If you want a medal, you've got to go under 10 seconds. So these are the zones that we take as benchmarks. Okay. The lines that we're seeing, these are two, uh, three different uh, athletes, two from Canada, one from uh, Germany. All right. We have our top athlete here um, who goes from <clears throat> 10, 40, down to under, down close, down to under 10 seconds. And then we have our, uh, another athlete from 1080, ends up at around 1040, okay? So this will be about a 5% improvement. And that's quite early. We see that quite a bit, you know, over four years, 5%, that's quite good. Confidence level means that's how uh, realistically this outcome is. Okay. Uh, going into uh, into the next zone. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. 
So we have another average of loss regression model. This time, what we're looking, rather than looking at time, we can look at height. So now we can apply this to any sports, really. Um, what we see here on the left side is the placing, uh, international placing. Um, and that could be at either at the World Cup or that could be at the World Championships. For, it, for us, for example, we have a world ranking um, where your season best is going to be uh, in that. But we have a funnel. If somebody's going to end up over seven years, seven years before the Olympics, zero, uh, year zero is our Olympics, year seven is um, seven years before. So our funnel of this medal potential here could be between 30 and it's quite a wide range. You know, if somebody's 30, they could still end up being first or something, something. So, and then it, it kind of goes, as I said, it goes in waves. And generally what we see is when there's big, a lot of sports have every every two, three years, they have world championships. You have a bit of a, a an increase, okay? It goes in a wave, but that's what we're going to be talking about. Funnel is we're starting from a wider funnel and narrowing it down as we get closer. All the podium mostly right now is looking at eight years back. Most of the NSOs, they have to start identify eight years. So right now for the, uh, uh, we just had our winter Olympics, uh, 2018, so plus eight, 2026. So they already, the National Sport Administration already has to tell OCP who's going to medal in 2026, right? So that's quite a task. And who are we going to put our money in? So another way to look at it, again, when we look at uh, uh, world's uh, placing, uh, we, we can look at junior levels, under 23 levels, World Cup, and then we can look at top. And so this is kind of a podium pathway to get to an So somebody is top four, top three at juniors, and it goes from like, they'll end up being top six, top three at under 23, then they make the switch to from, from under 23 to world to seniors and often it's very top, very top. So they might only be top 10. And so that's kind of the ideal regression. And but what this study did here was basically looking at the conversion rate. And you can actually see that only 10% of the ones who who place top three at juniors, the conversion rate is only to actually end up in the world. Now, if you have somebody in the senior level, you see it's going to jump up to 45, 50, 60 percent that they actually can end up. But that being one year before, that could be the top four, the top three, but at the Olympics, you might, you might not be. There's almost a 50 50 chance that you're not ending up meddling, even if you were top three years before. So we kind of have to statistically see that it's really, really, really tough make a prediction, uh, even if you have all the data. Okay, so questions? All right, so here I just wanted to show you, um, this is something we did, I was the head coach for a, a training this last year for the World Cups, and we had 58 athletes from 58 spots over there. And, uh, I took over the job three years before this, so 2014, 15, 16. So the first thing we did, we set benchmarks for every event, all right? And we based our benchmarks on the, la the last three county games. We looked at number three, number five, and number six. Okay? So number three, for, the, for us then, is that, so we looked at all the first place is 100 meters. Ones, what time did it take? How many meter was it from one third? One third, two thousand nine, two thousand nine, and two thousand five. And then we took an average of that. Okay. Um, we did that for every event, okay. male, female, 
We also had to make some adjustments um, for you because the issue with canadine is they'll be picking at a senior potential hurdles, the senior height. But well, with the funding or with our team, we sometimes have used the junior athletes that will be at a lower height for the senior hurdles. So we had to do a conversion. Um, what would that equal out for a lower height of hurdles or a shorter distance in the hurdles? And also for the throws, where we had lighter implements at the youth and the junior level. We had to make kind of conversion because we're still three years out, and I'm trying to figure out who's going to win medals at the Canadian three years, three years later. Okay, but what this exercise did for us, it helped us. So we had a budget, we had um, a certain amount of money that we could give out to athletes, and we, we call that the peer funding, um, and we would then pay out the on what standard they got, we would give them money. Okay. So it's um, competition, training camps, um, a general kind of if, if there was equipment needed, or anything that would help them to improve their performance. But that's, we needed this roster to make it fair, to be as objective as possible, and not making decisions on, oh well, yeah, you know, I really like you, but I don't like you. <laughs> So it was really based on that. And we also have, you can see here, the wheelchairs and the Special Olympics were all part of our program. So we made standards for these guys too, so that they knew what to go. And what it did, this tier one, everybody knew, if I can hit this standard, so yellow is tier one, is the red is tier two, and blue is tier, tier three. If I can hit tier one, I have a pretty good chance. And so this was the list then in 2016 we came up. Uh, that was our last funding list. We had 32 athletes who hit tier funding standards. Uh, we had 12 athletes that had a tier one, so at, at third place or, or better. Okay. Um, we, had about, we had three athletes that were in tier two, and we had another 15 or so athletes in tier three. 32 all together. No, I should know that. <laughs> okay. This obviously helped with us to give up funding to the athletes because they're easier. It also helped me because uh, people want to know how many medals do you have? Well, how do you know? How do you know? But now I know, okay, I have 12 guys in tier one, so I have 12 tier three. 12 is possible. We can do 12. I say 12. <laughs> just to be, because we know that conversion rate that I just talked about, the 60%, the 60% of 12 is not even fair. <laughs> it's more like uh, 7, all right? Um, but being optimistic, I said we can win this. We ended up winning one, <laughs> which was really cool. But there were certain things, obviously, that happened that, that weren't out of control. The first guy here, Mike Tate, who was our absolute best guy, he uh, made the Francophone Games, which were during the time of the international. Um, so he ended up going there, which is, you know, awesome for him. Not so great for my team, um, but obviously that was a no-brainer. No so we lost one in right brain. Matt Coolen, he, uh, he pulled his hamstrings in the heat uh, in the, and wasn't able to compete. Ben Brown, he won three medals. So it was great. He came out, he won the two... Uh, he, the silver in the 200, the 400, and the 1500. He was our wheelchair athlete. And I could go there. We had a lot of fourth place. Shanae Ford, Taylor Ford, Sarah Mitten won the gold medals. Bridget Ford, Donald won two medals. Special Olympics. He won the 100 and the 200. Okay. Um, and so on. So anyways, we ended up with nine medals in the end. Um, the conversion rate would have been... Uh, 75% out of 12. So that's 75 plus 12 is 40. There's a lot of tier threes here. Okay. Now, having said that, some of these tier threes, so by the way, nobody except Brian Shea or Kara Sherrill won a medal that wasn't a tier one. Okay. So he was the only one, and that was because mostly he just started. 
and he just improved. And, and with para athletes, you see that very often. You know, they come out, they have some para, uh, some previous sporting experience, they'll shoot it really quick. And so he was the only one, but none of the other ones came even close to that. I mean, they were, you know, they would make a final, seven, eight place, but it was pretty right off. The tier twos, um, George, uh, he, was, he was fine. And this guy, okay, so this guy, we had a tier two. We put in three years of funding into this guy. Right? And then at the uh, <clears throat> at the trials, it rained. It was raining, and it was hydro, and he just couldn't handle the rain. He came fourth. He didn't qualify for the final. So he's at tier two. If he jumps the 194 like he was in, when he was jumping, he could be in that level. Just like he only jumped like 170 at the trial. So we still, although we still we have this uh, list here, we still did a trial because <clears throat> these performances are all season best under the best conditions they could be going. Right, especially track and field. It's really heavy. If you have just that right tailwind, or if you have that, you know. This great weather, um, it makes a difference. So that's where we're still doing the trials because we want to know what can an athlete do under the band when when they have to bring their performance to the field. So that's a little bit when we look at the uh, results track, we have to look at that too. Is what can an athlete do when, when he actually has to or she has to bring it to the lab to the band? Okay. So quick recap. Before I go into the uh, sample that I did on virtual ATP, so we we do for the sporting results tracking, we do a sport audit. We have to know our our sport. After that, we'll go out and we'll find the, we'll find the data. We do the data mining. We set benchmarks, right? We set benchmarks for where do we need to be at what level. Uh, we will then look at the progression of our Top athletes or, or top athletes in, in the sporting results track. And then we'll make, we'll compare that to our athletes and we'll make a prediction. What did, are they medal contenders? Are they on the right track? Right? And then we'll make recommendation to the athlete or to the program or to the organization that they're working with. Can you just tell me what the So it might be a bit different parameters that we're, that we're looking at, right? But in the end, it's the same approach. You want to you want to look back. You want to look at historical data, and then try to predict from there what you can do in the future. It's looking into that crystal ball, you know, just as they said in Mark Moneyball. Um, nobody has the crystal ball, so we have to make decisions based on. So this is um, the, the time when we're, yeah, it was actually the last time uh, I did it, that I did for Andy. And uh, it's on wheelchair racing, and I did it um, based because two things, I have an athlete myself who's in this class, but I also had the privilege to work with uh, Brent Blackenhall, who's a world record holder um, in the nine time world champion. It was amazing working with him and, and seeing his professionality and just the way he is consistently winning races over and over again. I just want to show you a race so that you get a bit of better idea of what wheelchair racing looks like and what it's all about. Um, this is the, the World Championships 2017.
What goes into a tour? C53 features the reigning Paralympic champion, boxer and player, the former Paralympic champion Alan Wadi, and the former world champion Pierre Fairfax. Fred Lakatos has won the other event himself. The outside in lane 9 for the United States, the 400 meters plus medalist here, Brian Seaman. The 2004 Paralympic champion of 400 meters in Athens, Alan Adewale. The reigning Paralympic champion of 400 and 800 for Thailand, Dan Shirin Thayer. Thailand have only won two medals here, and he won them the silver. The world champion from 2002 of 400 and 800 from France, Pierre Fairbrand, bronze here in the 200. Gold in the 200 meters here, the reigning 100 meters, Paralympic champion for Canada, Frank Lakatos. Lane 4 from Korea, similar in the 400 and the 800 in the Asian Games in Incheon three years ago, Yu Byung-Hun. Lane 3 from France, similar in the 4, gone to the 1 at the Europeans in Swansea 2014, Nicolas Brignon. And in lane 2, Bronze in the 100 meters in 2013 of the World Tour Leon, Harry Osvaldo Silva. Hong Suk Man with the world record, championship record held 
by the eight-time world champion, Brent Lakatos. The final of men's 400 meters, C53. So away they go, Silva, Brignani, Yui, Lakatos, Fairbank, Tayo, Alan Wally, and Seaman. Superb start by Brent Lakatos. So away they go, Silva, Brignani, Yui, Lakatos, Fairbank, Tayo, Alan Wally, and Seaman. Superb start by Brent Lakatos. Did you want Troy's uh, Wi-Fi? Oh, that is? Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's funny because it's full screen. Yeah. I have. <laughs> oh yeah, well, yeah. No, it might be just uh, I, I'd like it if we <laughs> As always, for Canada based in Britain in Loughborough, with his wife gold medal winning Stephanie, solid star by Pio as well from Thailand, the Pioneer Jacket. Winning the silver medal here in the 200 meters. Ahead of Diamond, behind Lakatos. Setting his stop right here. Lakatos. This is up for a fight now. Heading towards the final bang. Lakatos is drawing in a player. In between the Fairbank and third place, they straighten up. It's Lagados, it's Pio, it's Lagados slightly out of front. Is he going to do a double here? Frank Lagados to Tanana. Yes, he will. Oh, Tanana. Red Lagados went to Pio with the silver. Fairbank to bronze. 47 57 is a new championship record. And Brent Lagados. I was there uh, coaching him at the 2013 World Championships. That was the first time he won a gold medal, and it was so I was so nervous. It was crazy, <laughs> um, but it was uh, it was so awesome to uh, be part of uh, part of that whole um, how should I say it? it? It's not just the race; it's all all of that. It's just like the whole thing, and we'll see like Brent's first Paralympics where he came back. Thirty-seven years old. Which I'll talk to you. So here's just a, a quick overview. Of what I'm going to, what I looked at in terms of the sporting results track. Um, I'm not going to break this all down, but basically, <coughs> um, doing the audit, doing the data mining, and then doing the graphs, and then making. That's what it all comes down to. Um, so this is quickly, and I don't want to do too much long-term athlete development, but this is the Athletics Canada long-term athlete development from active, uh, from active start all the way to active athlete for life. When we talk high performance, we're generally um, talking from like a learning to compete and then winning the Olympics. Okay? So when we're looking at it's back um, we have here 24 we're looking eight years back to from sometimes 86 to 87 to 85 um, now a lot of people think we should be more back to Bob Hill so but I just that's my personal kind of thing I think it's it's really early some level of bonus. It's, 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 it's,
for traffic. Now, it depends on the sport. That's why each sport has a different amount of money involved um, when it comes to age. The other thing, and I'll talk about this too, is I think that's one of the flaws is age-related, uh, especially on the parent side, where it should be like a more training age-related rather than um, watching the game. And that's one of the big downfalls. Yeah, I think that's one of, at least at our athletic Just one thing for the para, and that was called you know, the para archery. There is an extra two stages. We call it the awareness versus contact stage. Just because we have a lot of athletes, they get injured at a later stage in their life. So, excuse me, a lot of my athletes that I work with, they got injured when they were younger. They got injured in car accidents, and that was the reason they took up the sport. And so, for them, at first, it's really about the awareness what's out there and making that first contact. It's extremely important to have a good experience when you come back from such sport. So uh, we're, we're still lacking, especially in where the sport is going back in Canada, is on the basic kind of evolved path. Um, very often if somebody is not with a pro and they have a pro player or that, they can talk really much on, on an evolvement level. And that's what I that's that's an issue, you know, like that we have somehow so many sports are working on it. Um, but we need to be aware that this first it can't be you can't throw them into two big competitions right away, but it's really it all has to be a really good first sport. Um, so for the data mining, what I did, so I looked at the world top three, eight, and six ones. Three because that's podium. Eight, because that's what needs to be done uh, to make a final. And often, our Paralympic team, you have to be top 10. If you're not making top 10, your, your, your chances to make that team is limited. We have a quota with the national team. So meaning, you can't just have as many athletes as you play down to 10 years in the Olympics. Because they can't make it to the uh, spot. So we only get a certain amount of quota that's based on the performance we have the year before. So that's a top three based on the standards that have been set the year before. Uh, I'm not going to go too much, but the 16 rank for us, that's kind of to make a national team. You have to be 16 in the world and the benchmark is not going to be too good enough for the world <coughs> national team. So that's why these are really important benchmarks that I looked at. And I looked at the season best times for 400 meters. From IPC World of uh, Athletic Team Data Mining. I'm very fortunate to have that database where I can go back in a year and get all of the season best results from sanctioned training. So that's something to, when you do data mining, make sure these things are official official results and not bunch of numbers that you got when you were in the practice with a stopwatch and you know, <laughs> somebody uh, putting up on the uh, Same thing for Track five of top athletes progression over the last eight years. And that's so this is the website, and I'm just going to click through. So this is really cool. We have our uh, world rankings website of the Paralytic Team. Um, I think I'm going to click on that one probably because that's the last one. And so what I get here, so for every year for the 400 meter, I get the, the event, I get the name. Here, you can't get it here. But so, Wakato's friend, so Canada, so that was his time 47 49. Um, time to millisecond, um, the date, and where it was. So, here, the location for us is very important. Argon is, is the fastest track in the world, it's in Switzerland. Um, they, every time they put on a race there, everybody will go there. 
is for wheelchair racing, the harder the surface, the better. Argonne has one of the oldest small road tracks and it's still maintained well. Uh, and that's why the wheelchair racers, they will come here. So seeing what track for me makes a little bit of a difference of, of how I evaluate the performance of the driver. Uh, and of course, too, it depends a bit to what kind of weather we're dealing with. And like I said, that sometimes it can be draining, especially in rain for the wheelchair riders. It can really uh, hinder them. Um, but that's all the information I get. So this is the ranking. So I get 2016, 2015, 2014, 2013, 2012, 2011, 2010. So now what I did, I looked at top three history, the top eight, and the top six. Okay. So here's the top three lines, right? 2010, to, become, to be the third fastest in the world, you had to be 49. 2017, you have to be 48.91. <clears throat> this here, not so very fun. I did that in Excel, <laughs> just an XY scatter. And uh, this whole thing, actually, I did this in Excel like I did this in math. I just kind of uh, made it a bit of a screen, screen mm -hmm. screenshot, and that's how I put it in the slide. So that's my extent of technology that I'm doing. But what it does, it's a very simple graph, X, Y, scatter chart graph, and it just came out like this. It gives you, you can see here, 2012, the parallel to 2016, parallel to 6. Every time there's a parallel, it gives a bit of a, a, a fast track. 2017, we were even faster, and that's due to the Argonne track. We are on that track, and that shifts about a second fast. And that's why I think it's not a good thing that way. Um, and that's why I said you have to be sometimes careful when you look at the that's where you need to have the backup knowledge of the course data. Now <clears throat> we're looking at the top eight. So same, similar kind of a picture, 2012, we had to be a little bit faster. They started out at 50.7, so that and then ended up at 27 or 50.85. So overall, not that much of an improvement still. So you, you could say, somebody could say, oh, well, you know, they're still pushing the same now, I personally think this is just enough. You know, if you look at that progression, I think it's going to keep on looking like this. I think this is a bit of an outlier that, you know, they they just learn the number, you know, the top three were top fifth, and then the other ones, fourth or eighth, just go into what the Exactly, yeah, yeah. And then it kind of looks a little similar for the top 16. With the top 16, you need a 53, 69 to be consistent in 2010. And now it's a 52, 53. But again, we had a parallel here in 2012. We can go down. And that was also long, but it's long for the very fast track as well. So when you had a parallel here, <clears throat> and then again, 2016 in Rio, and then of course 2017 all the way through. Some guys, that's the thing, only the top eight can go here. You know, only the ones who can afford it. The ones later on, they might not go into that fast track as quickly. Um, they might not have the time. Questions? So then I overlap these three, and that again, I was able to do just in Excel. It's really easy um, to list the times they were there um, beside each other. I think it's easy to see the time I did, and again, you can get a nice little graph seeing the graphs compared to each other. One thing that kind of stands out to me is, again, in the Paralympic years, everything comes a little bit closer together. Okay? So the density just gets a little bit closer and closer and closer. And then the top 16, you know, the top 15, the top 16, the top 53, the top 52, the top 57, the top 50, the top 53, the top 52, the top 53. So then, so this was just an average. It was just looking at the, not looking at a specific class. What I'm going to do now is I'm looking at the athletes and kind of go backwards, all right? So from 2017, I'm going backwards to 2009. And I look at what was the progression of the rank athletes. Okay? You can see in 2010, if the blue line is our top three line, and I compare that to those top three, that's our closest line. 
he was already at the top three, and then by 2013, that was the first time he won a gold medal. He just broke away. So he he is below that top three line. I can tell you, OTC takes a lot of time. And really, it's all what I did. My data set for this is just taking the, again, the top three data set that I did early on and took his data set. Yeah. And that, that, honestly, to do this, it takes like half an hour. Yeah, a lot of background work. A lot of background work, yeah. But to actually do this, you yeah, know. Well, the chart itself. And it, it, it helps because, so we, let's look at this guy. So this guy, he is. Um, Born in 1996, so it's very young. He was 20 years old at the Paralympics in uh, in Rio. He actually won the gold medal in Rio. He got the gold medal in Rio. But this guy is an outlier. He comes in. He was 1953, uh, 91, and then in 2015 he goes 49, 26, and he goes 47. He just comes in like a comet, you know. And it absolute power knocks him for it. And he was the one in the race who came second at the world championship. So they're battling right now. So you have a 37-year-old uh, battling with a 29-year-old. So now the thing is with him, uh, you mean late in, in like terms of? Like his time in the Olympics. I'm not sure. I, I, I think he's young. Now the thing is, he saw international. So now I don't know. He might have competed nationally uh, before that because he was so young, you know, that that I just couldn't find any other result, and I didn't I didn't bother going in beyond that <laughs> international data. I mean, it would be interesting to see what his international data. I probably need to that before it should, you know, I, I need to see that too. But I think this is a very cool kind of a, a, a stream that can show it is possible to. Um, and then we have another guy here, Fairbanks, born in 1971, right? So he's 40, uh, 46. Yes, he's 21. And he's he is still in the top three, right? And he he actually was 11 seven years ago when he was 40, and he's still and he improved and got into the top three at 47. Imagine that, right? So now with him too, the story might be that he was injured a little later in life. It's just wheelchair racing is a very technical sport. It takes a long time to learn the technique. And so it, I always say eight to ten years at least to get to the top in OTC professional capacity, right? So uh, who knows? I actually know him. He was in 2004. He was first in the world race in Boston. That was his first one. So I don't know. I do know that something he went down to Australia for a year and just went back home. He started training once again. Now that's where we come in to okay, what are these guys doing to get from eleven down to fifth, you know, or then from you know to get onto the podium. That's what we have to do. Okay, I'm almost done here. Um, I have two more guys. So this guy is uh, Brian Seen. He's American. He's about the same age as my Adam as well. Yeah. So that's why, to me, he's very interesting because um, he is about the same stature in terms of body weight and everything. So as we said before, we kind of have to look at what what the physical measurements are. But he was 1911 in uh, 2011, and then just in 2012 had an amazing race where he's in national. And then fall back a bit, but then it was able to pick it up. 26, he won that race for him. But he's hovering around that top three. 
Um, oh, one more guy. So here is a guy who's been in this world for over 20 years. Uh, and, you know, it should know. Uh, so 70 years ago, he was in full game and kind of coming back. But his general direction was his company. Exactly. Would you invest into this guy? Mm -hmm. no. Really nice guy. Really, really nice guy. But for a, for a, for a national team investment, that's not what he's now, the other guy shirts with all the head, but I would put my money to say they're doing very well. And that's what I say, like sometimes age biases, you know, where you think, oh, he's too old, his legs are gone. <laughs> and now here it's Ben Brown. He, see, he is the athlete I'm coaching. That's probably, that's his first call. He will throw quite a bit away. <laughs> but he's getting into the top, he was 17 last year, of course, so he's getting to close to that top six um, and that national team, senior national team uh, value. And he started internationally in 2015, so that's how far back. I do have his data, but I just took the international. And we can see it came in, he had a bit of an off year in uh, 2016, uh, focused more on one and two, so 2015 because he thought he had less competition nationally or less. Um, and he missed actually the Paralympics by one second. Um, but now we're focusing back on the 400 because his endurance is, is getting a lot better and he likes doing the 400 better. We just see more improvement in potential for improvement in the six. What I tried to do with him, so what we looked at we looked at, okay, if he wants to make a Paralympic team in 2020, what does he have to do? Or what does he have to show? So we predicted that in order to be in the top uh, 16 in the Olympics, right before, you need to have a low grade of 7. So in order to get there, um, we looked at 2017, he was 53.7. So the improvement from 2016 to 2017 um, was just over a second. If he can continue that improvement, he should be able to hit a low grade in 2011. So that, if we make a stride, straight line, that's what it would look like in 2018, 19, 20. So this gives us some benchmarks, and this is the progression. What I did, I overlapped with the bright semen from the studies that I just said is kind of similar to him. But this is the curve that he did five, four years prior. I just moved it over now. So it kind of shows me, okay, this is a possible trajectory. Now, of course, I have to say more up and down, but the trajectory is about the same. Right? So it is a possibility, not top three, he's top three seven. But he won't be top three. He's not going to be medalist. But he might get into that top eight spot or top ten that we need him to make that team. Sometimes you skip the last eight years. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, if you show them the data, look, you're here, this is this is what we, now, you don't want to be too outcome oriented in your goals and in your goal setting, you know, I, I like to be on the closest, but, yeah, don't skip the last year. Exactly, you have the chance if you get a 5% improvement between now and then, you know, do it and, and then show them other people have done it too, you know, so they know it's doable, because it's all, one tennis the world for four minute mile, everybody will be doing it, you know, but, but, but a lot of people don't. It's, it's in your mind, too, you know, it's, they know they can do it. I did one more thing then. I looked at the ages, because I started seeing this pattern in 2020. We look at, uh, so the top eight, I kind of did a bar, bar graph, graph. And so we have 37, 21, 46, 28, 45, 33, 45, 28. It's crazy, up and down. Average age of 35 in 2020. So that really shows me there, even if you're going up into the 40 in wheelchair athletics, you're still able to be the, at the top level in this country. Now, it doesn't mean you, you can't do it if you're very young, of course. But again, this shows a little bit more. Um, I think I talked a little bit about the airplane thing before and just how it's a little outdated. It seems to be a bit too old for me. Um, again, we really got to look at that difference, the 25 years, 
in athletics or paralytics don't have enough benchmarks yet. So for our national team, they just say 2015 is our they're our national team. But what do you have to do before that? Like to get to that top level? What are kind of like some of the social media posts that are not really great at development where you're taking them in and they want you to be in the top sixteen or whatever. Um, due to a lack of depth in some events, ranking doesn't actually we have some classes um, that don't even have sixteen athletes internationally. They might have some paralytics and some other stuff, but they might not even have fifteen. So it's not really fair to select somebody to a team that is fourteen out of fifteen, you know, versus somebody who's seventeen out of one hundred and twenty. See what I mean? Like, but our national team will select. Because they say, well, it's the top 16, we have a chance to be um, in that second class. But um, if there's not that many, you still need to look at that and see what that is. <clears throat> uh, again, so some of the takeaways after this exercise that I think is just creating a clear performance pathway for new athletes is some types of like benchmarks rather than just at the rankings, actually looking at the performances of this of six teams of this class, how many of them we got in that competition. Um, for the importance of performance curve towards the top three, is somebody progressing towards the top three or are they progressing away from the top three? I think that is so important for us coaches to know is a is an athlete progressing or are they decreasing? Where in my opinion, if somebody's not progressing over two seasons, then you need to make a change. The coaching change, the environment change, the sport change, you're not in the right place. Especially at a young age, you should be improving every year. Uh, overcome chronological age, focus more on training, which we said that before. Especially in the para games, you're going to have more injuries later on. Uh, but also on the able body type, um, just looking more. I think a kid starts training as they're going in hockey at six years old. So by the time they're 16, their training age is 10 years. You know? And they, I know, I know. And so we look at, oh, this is a huge talent. This is 14, huge talent. Got to support this kid. But you know what? The kid who started at 12 and the past two years old might be almost there, but the same chronological age, but the training age is only two. Do you think in another two years he's going to progress to the three or the four? Once he started late, who has less training. So we've got to look at training age rather than chronological age. Allow for an environment of sound transfer based on classification and specialty. Again, I think if somebody, if they're not progressing in certain sports, in paralytics or in para sports, it's very easy to say. Um, and too many athletes stick in the same sport for too long. Now, you know, they say, well, they love it, they have a passion for it, but why not try something else if you're stuck? Try a different sport, you know, and try, even like we, we can look at certain sports are more earlier and certain sports are later. We've had athletes go, let's say, from swimming to athletics and from athletics to rowing, you know, and that is totally possible. Or archery, you know, it could be, I don't know what the age there's some older athletes that age. Yeah. Yeah. So that that talent transfer, I mean, why not do that talent transfer with those options who are stuck? Because we're not looking at the data, we're not looking at the progression. Because we still think, oh well, one year they get better, one year that you know. Address the depth in each national sports team and competition. So yeah, like I said, um, sometimes there's just not that many participants, so we really need to address also, the amount of competition when you look at who's the best. For the wheelchair racers, it's kind of limited to Switzerland, and there's another race in Dubai, and there's one race, it's down in the States, but it's not really that tough. It's really Switzerland and Dubai. That's not a rough sport. There's more races, but those are the top races to hit the fastest time. Those are the fastest tracks to hit the fastest time. If you're not there, you kind of, uh, you're
the running behind me all the time is off. Anyways, this is uh, kind of it. But you know, I think it's so valuable to fill out yourself sometimes. You know, it's because sometimes when you get the, get the numbers from the National League, it's really helpful and it gives you those benchmarks. But but I know I, I when you start looking at the data, you start attaching it to the NFL professional data. Um, and then especially right now I'm working on the NFL profile. Um, that's even much more in depth because you're not just looking at you're looking at the <coughs> skill, and you know the social environment, um, the trade shifts, the use of players, um, the equipment, the drugs, the food. Like you're looking at all the aspects to really then figure out, okay, what does it really have to become to get to this level? What do you have to do in order to get to the top level that they want to be? Great job. Yeah? Oh, hold on to that. I thought it was awesome. Yeah. Super cool. Let's try to do a little. Yeah, no, really. Nate. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll tell them just because that's a nice speaker <laughs> that someone could make off with. <laughs> but I'll let them know. Yeah, that's super good. Oh, good, you're here. We're just talking. I was like, we'll tell them that this is. Yeah, it was totally awesome. Well, like when you said, and I knew the uh, the one they use for classes is so in demand. I was like, oh, we're not paying. Like, just yeah. I know some <laughs> classes can't even get it. Yeah. Yeah. This was great because the video was kind of uh, the the voice wasn't uh, the, 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 mm -hmm. the volume was just oh, really low. So with this, we were able to really. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it worked really good.
I think. Uh, oh, is there a bit? Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Safe travels. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I think certain areas are supposed to get like some stuff, like, yeah, Picto. Like, I don't think we're getting much, but I know they all get dumped on and like, hey, Brett. We've been yeah, it's been pretty decent, like, really not bad at all. That's what we're doing. Well, no, we're running out of hospital. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, we just use different colors. Because he's got, because he's got
it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I packed it away. I was trying to make off with it. <laughs> no, I was like, I didn't go anywhere with it. Like, it's here. Yeah, that's so. Yeah, if you ever have to like. 